From the ashes of their former lives, the Dowie Tsar rise with chaotic energy to force the world into molten destruction. Welcome to the Chaos Dwarf Mastery Guide, where we will quickly and concisely run through the faction to nail it on Legendary without any cheese or exploits. The Chaos Dwarfs landed early in Warhammer 3's life cycle, standing out with mechanics that are very complex but also very rewarding. They reside east of the lands of the regular Dowie, which long ago formed the continual expansion of Dwarven Mines. The Great Catastrophe saw the first endless tides of chaos wipe these holdings clean, save for a few trapped and cut off from all communication. Even more would die from battle or starvation, leaving only the most hardened and merciless to survive, but after realising they had been forgotten by their friends and even gods, they would finally be heard by a new minor god of chaos. Hashut, the Bull Lord of Darkness. If you're expecting simply evil dwarfs, you're in for a rude shock. Other than supreme war machines and unkillable infantry, this society is completely unrecognizable from the honor-driven hierarchy of the true Dawi. The Chaos Dwarves, or self-referred to as the Dawi Tsar, form a very small ruling class which must rule over an entire society of slaves. This requires the most sadistic accounting you have ever seen to keep lifespans just long enough to suit their ends. When viewing the strengths of the Chaos Dwarves, having a completely subservient population does provide some strengths and flexibility. Since your population have no rights, the climate basically has no bearing. Well hey, if no one can complain, there's no bad news to be had. Also, there is no growth because, again, this is not a free population. Everyone there is a team player and there to work for you. Wink wink. Thankfully, to keep this population subservient, you have some of the greatest characters in the game. These absolute titans won't just hold order, they will also devastate the enemy on the battlefield. But the rest of the army too, they are known as the Kings of Fire. Their guns, their weapons, just about everything is on fire with these guys. Of course, they have the Law of Fire, but they also have their own unique Law of Magic, the Law of Hashut. Grounded in volcanic ash and heat, this law is known for using ash and cloud to slow the enemy and weaken them to fire damage, and then melting them with your fire weapons. Its other spells are expensive, but all deal very good damage. The cutthroat lifestyle of the Dwarven Elites lends itself to exceptional administration. Just like the regular Dowie, they are very strong in their technologies, but these guys are out of control. The Hellforge is used to increase your caps of Dwarf units, and later on can be used to attach enhancements and upgrades to your units. The Tower of Tsar provides faction-wide upgrades. If you follow my steps in this guide, you will automatically accrue Conclave Influence. This is the currency used to buy seats in the tower. Take that seat and receive the benefit, but if you have just one seat in that grouping, you will also gain that group buff. You are competing for these seats with the other Chaos Dwarf Lords, but it doesn't matter if they take a seat, don't worry about it. You'll confederate them later. Spend your money going up, don't waste it going back down. Make sure the first three seats you get are these. These are incredibly important for fast tracking your economy. You can also use Conclave Influence to upgrade main settlements. Now this isn't usually worth doing until later in the campaign, however early on you can use this to fast track to tier 2 to help unlock your heroes sooner. And late game you will have so much of this, you will be erecting tier 5 fortresses everywhere you go. Which brings me to the next strength, an unstoppable late game with a very complete army that can pretty much cater to any playstyle. But moving on to the weaknesses, it will take time for you to get that endgame powerful military because you have restricted unit caps. Well, with so few dwarfs, how do we field these armies? Well, we're just going to pull some laborers off the tools and push them in front of some enemies. That's right, at a discount cost, you can field desperate, starving laborers. This should be a resort of only last choice, and if you do, keep them within the range of a dwarf. Dwarf Warrior and they will get a slight buff to leadership. The Goblins sit in elusive formation and have better melee defense. This means that they are better at sitting still, holding the enemy in place, and that's where you get your Orc Laborers to run around the side and then charge into the flank with their armor piercing axes. But this is only if you have nothing else to hire, because fate just has it that the Chaos Dwarves have an even better option. Long ago, the ruthless regime of the Chaos Dwarves nearly came tumbling down when the Black Orcs revolted against them. Despite their magic and chaotic power, they were overrun completely by the Black Orcs. But who should come to their aid? The treacherous Hobgoblins, always in it for themselves, 
betrayed the Black Hawks and all the Greenskins at that, and they are absolutely reviled and never forgiven by any of the Greenskins. In a society where every life that's not a Chaos Dwarf is completely disposable, these guys have made a pretty good niche for themselves. On your first turn, you should always build the Hobgoblin camp and get these guys because they are always better to get than laborers. The archers shoot flaming arrows into the enemy and are useful even until the mid game because they shoot over your gunpowder units. Hobgoblin cutthroats can hold the front line but this is where you should get your dwarf warriors to do the heavy lifting. Instead some sneaky gits can sneak around the back, throw some knives into the enemy and capture the enemy settlement before they even know what's happened. And if you need some extra mobility you can always get wolf archer riders. Gordas Backstabber is the legendary goblin hero available to every single chaos dwarf lord. Build the barracks high uh, five hobgoblin units and you'll get him in your army. He's a powerhouse character giving excellent buffs to hobgoblins. He also provides some much needed replenishment to your armies. Rank him up in your main army and then drop him in a brand new army of hobgoblin units. Naturally as your campaign progresses you will replace greenskins with war machines and dwarfs. First get an additional dwarf warrior and then an additional blunderbuss unit. An early army with three dwarf warriors and two blunderbuss units will be able to shred most things. After this point introduce artillery, but this brings us to another weakness, they are all single piece artillery. Most factions have artillery pieces with usually at least three models. This means more projectiles and more saturation. The Chaos Dwarf only have a single unit, but boy does it pack a punch. Don't worry about Hellforge upgrades until at least turn 30, maybe even later. You need these armaments to build your buildings as well as increase your unit caps. Just a quick reminder guys, if you are enjoying the video, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps out. Ask any question in the comments, I answer everything. And if you'd like to talk strategy, feel free to join the Discord. Cheers. Also slowing the Chaos Dwarfs down is the fact their construction is very expensive and a bit longer than most other factions, usually requiring resources that you have to mine and process. Chaos Dwarves don't even have growth, instead they must swell their population by effectively capturing people. This means to sustain and grow your empire, you will need to be continually at war, bringing more people to help man those tools. To help combat this, you can actually spend some of your excess laborers on Dictat's local which can be useful to bolster control, but the better use for excess labor usually is to reduce your construction time. You can sacrifice a few laborers by working them to death to instantly complete an upgrade or a building, allowing you to quickly recruit units or even bolster up a garrison in the event you are invaded. Don't feel pressured to use either of these tools. Labor is to fuel your economy first and foremost. Never forget that. If all this sounds a little bit complicated, well, I guess it is because these guys are some of the most savvy administrators in the game, but as the player, that means you'll be shouldering a lot of that responsibility. Although very sadistic, they are very witty and very patient for an evil faction. Make sure you are too, because you will need to balance all of these administrative skills but if you're able to, you will dominate your campaigns. But when doing so, you will find the Chaos Dwarfs are incredibly ruthless. They have no regard for anyone else that is not a dwarf. You're either going to live for them long enough to build a few things until you collapse dead, or they will just grind you instantly into paste and feed you into the Hellforge. They do not believe in having prisoners that have their own free will. They do not believe in vassals. Traveling through a network of demonic train lines, after the opening turns, you can start to send out a caravan to one of several pre-selected destinations. Have your convoys seek out any resource that you're short in. Make sure you visit each of them once because they will return with a unique item and some of these are absolutely excellent. Make sure the first three destinations you go to are either Black Crag for the Mirror Shield, the Wizard Callus Palace which grants extra campaign movement, or Castle Drakenhof which will give you an item that provides regeneration which is absolutely absurd and you will want to attach these to their resident demon Smith sorcerers. While slow in number, these demigods rule the Chaos Dwarf realms. Brimming with magic and power, these guys rule the battlefield and dominate their realms, politicking with each other, but understanding the constraints of their limited population means they do need to work together in order to keep control. But there is no forgiveness for any weakness, as a single revolt could undo everything. They come in a hero variant, essentially the Dwarven Ballistics Calibration to nearby units, or they can even heal their war machines. Have the hero variant rocking the Laura of Fire, 
Empire to burn away weaker enemies and have the Lord of Ashut there to slow the enemy and weaken them to fire, or vice versa. This covers most of your magic needs and the Law of Death can be used, but mainly to lower enemy leadership. This is useful because when enemies are killed while routing, this counts as captives. So yes, chasing down every last foe that is broken will help you get more captives, which can be repurposed as laborers. Fun fact, keep a secondary army following your lead army. Each Lord is capable of bringing in their own group of captives, so you can very easily multiply extra captives per every battle by having a small support army behind each army. And of course, each army should be led by the Lord variant of the Demon Smith Sorcerer, the Sorcerer Prophets. These guys are the head honchos that run the Chaos Dwarven Realms. So let's kick off the cast with the greatest Sorcerer Prophet, Astrogoth Ironhand. Twisted, ambitious, and incredibly powerful, he is living proof of the Curse of Stone, the price the Chaos Dwarves pay for wielding the Winds of Magic. Astrogoth is the best recommended first campaign, the definitive experience, and he gets around in a mechanical mech suit because half of his body has already transformed into stone. He is a powerhouse caster and specializes in bull centaurs. The Sorcerer Prophet next in line, waiting for his boss to turn to stone, is Strazoth the Ashen. My personal favorite, a hybrid caster fighter, which like all the other Sorcerer Prophets, gets to mount a Bale Taurus, a red-hot fire-breathing bull incarnate of a should himself flying around from the skies above, nailing a devastating mix between speed, power, and agility. Getting this powerhouse option as a mount frees up your armaments to be spent on other unit caps like artillery. Drazoth himself specializes in heavy infantry as well as Kadai units. The final choice is Zartan the Black, pretty much the most sadistic general and administrator in all of the Warhammer setting. This guy makes getting captured by the Dark Elves look like a holiday. He's an efficient general specializing in herding up captives. Now to run through the faction from tier one up to tier five, which will tell the story of your campaign and the challenges addressed at each point. So starting off at tier one, always take hobgoblins in place of laborers. In this early stage, I recommend having three dwarven warriors and two blunderbuss units in the following formation. You can use goblin arrows to shoot over the top get a magma cannon in each of your early armies. This leaves a burning vortex which absolutely wrecks and is key to forcing the enemy to come to you. Check out the formations video after this for more. Having a secondary army following with a few sneaky gits will allow you to flank around the rear as well as get more captives post battle. You'll want to rush to tier 2 as quickly as possible to gain access to the incredible heroes at your disposal. The Infernal Castellan can hold the line but he works best as a sniper. If possible have one in each army to increase the campaign movement. Make sure the first research you get is to increase your sorcerers and a bull centaur torox. Let's get into bull centaurs. We all understand the dwarven frame is quite sturdy and able to withstand all forms of punishment, and that includes chaotic energy. The bull centaur is chaotic energies mangled into the dwarven form, the end result being a half dwarf, half bull monster. You only need two, at most four, in any army, but they can punish absolutely everything and make up the mobile arm of your armies. Take the regular variant to hold the front, and later on, the Great Weapons version is great at destroying enemy monsters. The Bull Centaur Torok is an incredibly strong hero, and get these wherever you can. They absolutely wreck. They can hold the line, plow through like a chariot, and add duel many things. Specialize in the defensive stats and they will never let you down. After this, make sure your next research is the Goblin Labor, as well as give your Dwarf Warriors plus 4 melee defense. This boosts every Dwarf in every garrison get it. Now as to the economy, I have a dedicated video, but to get you started, there are three types of building. One is the tower. You can only build this at a capital and always do it. Next most important are outposts. Outposts will require labor to be directed to this province, but will start creating raw materials. This is the most popular building in the early stages. Finally, there are factories, and these convert excess raw materials into armaments, which can be used to increase your unit caps, unit upgrades, but more importantly, your military buildings, which is where these should go in the early stages. As a general rule of thumb, if the province only has two settlements, just build a factory, but for three or more, you should build outposts. Get your outposts to tier two so they can both generate gold as well as create raw materials. This will have a negative impact on control, but both outposts and towers can help correct this. I cannot 
cannot stress enough that raw material production is what will help push you from the early to the mid game. Factories should be built as a reaction to having too many raw materials. Factories can convert raw materials into gold, but this is so counterproductive. The only reason you should ever do this is if you are producing way too many armaments. Instead, these raw materials should have been used on building up your empire instead of converting to armaments. And even still, at this later stage, you're better off using these armaments to enhance your units in the Hellforge. You can give barriers, increase resistance, replenishing ammo on your missile units. This has far more utility in the late game than gold, which you really will be swimming in if you've been building enough outposts. However, throughout your campaign, you will need to build factories because you'll need armaments, but where you place these can have some strategic impact. Factory has defensive siege towers allowing you to repel attacks much better, so you should situate these on the outskirts of your empire, protecting your fragile outposts. If you've done things correctly and have an abundance of tier 2 outposts, they are both producing raw materials and gold, which will help cover everything in time. When you notice your raw materials producing too high, just build another factory to redirect it into armaments. The more outposts you have in a province, the more the labour demand will be. If you don't meet the labour requirement, the raw material production will reduce. This reduction will be seen when your efficiency is below 100. You can keep your efficiency at 100% by not having outposts in small two settlement provinces, allowing you to saturate and redirect all of your labour into these large profitable mining towns. So not every province will need a factory, but sometimes your decision can be made by having unique buildings which will give bonuses to raw material or armament production. Your first province contains a unique drill. For this reason you should always have an outpost as well as a factory in your first province. As you expand you'll find several natural resource buildings so if you see any iron, marble or timber, organise your buildings around these. Even as you reach tier 3 you should be aiming to get as many tier 2 outposts as possible to provide the gold and raw materials to power you. Militarily, you'll have access to their war machines, which you should split between your armies to make the use of your unit caps. And magma cannons will predominantly carry you and you can still invest in your infrastructure rather than your military. Here you'll have access to the Infernal Guard, your next tier of infantry. While it's just good to have more dwarfs to hold the line against your artillery, the Fireglade variant is very, very good. Whilst it doesn't melt the enemy quite like a blunderbuss does, it has a much better range. And eventually the Infernal Iron Sworn, the Chaos Dwarf Iron to the Dowie Slayers, but somewhat different. They've been shamed and must redeem themselves, donning a cripplingly burning mask which cannot be removed until the shame is lost. They are as glorious as their do-gooder counterparts and you should absolutely field them to protect your high-end artillery. And high-end artillery, the granddaddy of them all, the Dreadquake Mortar. Boy is this thing a lot of fun to use. This is the gold standard of artillery. A single volley of this absolutely nails whatever is underneath it. Even better, you can put a train of death on the front of it, allowing it to pummel through enemies as well as rain death from above. Having one or two of these in your late game armies is as fun as it is effective. As for mobility, the Bull Centaurs have this covered and kind of put the Kadai out of the job. The Kadai are living infernal creations straight from the Hellforge and the granddaddy of them all, the Destroyer, is pretty damn cool and it can be laid with all sorts of buffs from the Hellforge and is more late game gleeful domination than early game strategy. Honestly, using the Hellforge to put Frenzy on all of your Dwarf Warriors is a much cheaper and more effective solution. And the same can be said for missile damage and replenishment on your ranged units. You can even put barriers on your units it's obscene, but despite how amazing these upgrades are, you won't really find yourself actually needing them until at least the late game. The Chaos Dwarf roster is incredibly strong. The unit caps are the only thing that limit you. So use your armaments to increase your unit caps and you'll instantly have an unbreakable front line of hard Chaos Dwarfs. Close range blunderbusses delete enemy characters. A couple of fire glaives to provide supporting fire. And bull centaurs to run up the flanks to pin the enemy in place and carve up enemy monsters. And we haven't even mentioned the artillery raiding bombardments from overhead while your demonic sorcerers fly around on Bale Taurus, blackening the battlefield with magma, ash and death. Honestly, the units don't need a lot of help. Around this time, you should have completed the Tower of Tsar, which allows you to confederate the other Chaos Dwarf factions. Once confederated, you gain not just their realm, but all of their bonuses from the Tower of Tsar, which means the only use of Conclave influence is to quickly check every settlement up to tier 5, which is the point you'll probably notice yourself being completely unstoppable. But that was that campaign, now it's time to make yours. Gather the broken survivors, learn the ways of the new god, be ruthless unforgiving, and let them never 
ever forget again the name of the Dowie Tsar. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I absolutely love this faction. They're probably my favorite Chaos Allied faction. If you love a unique race with lots of fun things to do, check it out. Please consider liking and subbing. It really helps out. This is Alvin. I'll see you next time.